Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I thought that I would leave up my editing screen so that, so that you would see that uh, Keynote thinks that uh, Chiari needs to be spell-checked and, and changed to something else. So that <laughs> speaks to the uh, challenge of the Chiari Foundation, and it speaks to the problem of insufficient dissem dissemination of knowledge of the condition, which is a major part of the major delays in diagnosis that, uh, that we all see here. Uh, Dr. Klinga mentioned that we'd have a, a very experienced and eminent panel and suggested that uh, I lean on them for the talk. And so I thought about it and I thought, awesome, because it happens all the time that I see patients as a practicing neurosurgeon whose conditions I don't understand, who don't make any sense to me. And so I thought I would just wrap them up into one talk and go over the cases one by one and ladle the, the football over to them to, to hear what they might have to say. And as I go along, you'll end up with the idea, at least the idea that I have, that the disease isn't really that well defined. So we have, uh, and some of the presentations we made have the idea that we're going to compare Chiari and non Chiari, uh, but the disease in my mind is really not that well defined. And part of what I wish to present here is some real life situation so you can start to get a feel for the complexity and the richness of the variety of the disease as we go through. So let's start with the, uh, the Chiari dichotomy. So I have two images and two presentations here. One is a 24 year old female with incidental Chiari and the other is a 26 year old who lost her job to intractable exertional headache. And when you talk to her, she has excruciating headache. If she coughs, sneezes, laughs, can't even chuckle, barely go to the bathroom, uh, has two small children, can't pick them up because this crippling headache. Holds a job, single mom, very, very tough, hardworking woman, and would do anything she can to stay at her job and support her kids. We have two images here of, of Chiari, and in one of which uh, we have a tonsils that are shaped in a peg go way down below the frame and magnum. And in the other one, we have a, a case where the tonsils, they do go low, but they're rounded. And you can see T1 dark signal in front of the brain stem, consistent with the preservation of a CSF signal there. So then radiologically, the one on the left is milder, and the one on the right is more severe. But clinically, they don't correspond. The one on the left is the one that presents asymptomatic because that person fell off a bicycle and got a concussion and it has a, a brain MRI and has that finding there. And the one on the left is the one with the intractable characteristic symptoms. Okay, so this is the Chiari dichotomy, at least to a practicing clinician, is that it's commonly asymptomatic and incidental, but when it's symptomatic, the symptoms can be crushing. So, the disease is not well defined. The radiology is not a sufficient method in which to define the disease, in my opinion. And in children, in Chiari, they have a further problem yet, in that exertional headache in the adult is a reference symptom. They all seem to have it in common for all the other variety of things that they'll have brain fog, toe tingling, uh, they'll all typically have exertional headache, but that is not so much the case in children. So let's start with some questions for our panel then. What is the difference between the symptomatic one and the asymptomatic one? It's a great, great question. Let's go back to the MRI. The MRI tells the tale. Now, this is not a normal study in other ways. The, um, the, she has an empty cella. An empty cella means that the, the hole at the base of the skull underneath the, underneath the brain, which contains the pituitary gland, the pituitary gland is flattened like a pancake. And that implies chronic increased intracranial pressure. And she also has a flattened pons. The front of the pons has been flattened which implies that this brain stem is being pulled downward. An MRI was with, uh, with uh, dye, 
involved would show that this that the that, uh, the uh, there is some um, enhancement, and I I would predict that this patient has what's called uh, idiopathic intracranial hypotension, and uh, probably the headaches are worse or made better when she lies down. And that uh, uh, this is one of the reasons that all PREs aren't 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 the same. You, you can't. Pet, this is caused by something else. And um, so uh, you know, I can't be sure of that with this with this. But it looks to me like that the, the, the pons has been stretched and flattened, and the, the, there's an empty cell. Well. I think personally, if, if you operate on the MRI, you do the wrong operation about 40% of the time. And that goes for anything in the spine or craniocervical junction. Uh, I would have thought that the patient on the right was the worst because there's ventral brainstem compression as well as the Chiari. I, I was surprised when you switched the arrows. The uh, patient on the left seems to have the skull um, seems to be a little bit smaller and there may be some thickening of the skull as well and it could actually even be some just crowding in there. We have no idea whether she has uh, venous stenosis, thrombosis of the major sinuses. Um, th there's so many causes of headache um, in the upper cervical spine. If, if you did a, a dynamic film on her you might find craniocervical instability or atlantoaxial instability, uh, or uh, instability at C3-4, or 4-5, which can cause headache. Uh, even tethered cord, and I, I think uh, Al was suggesting that maybe there's some tension on the spinal cord. Uh, tethered cord syndrome can cause headache. So um, I think that uh, to simply look at one picture and make up your mind, would be really the wrong thing to do. And I, uh, to me, uh, there's so many comorbid conditions of Chiari's that you know Chiari is often a bystander to what's really going on. Uh, I have uh, little to add except say I think none of us are are not surprised uh, that the. the that there is a switch here. Uh, we all expected the one that was squeezed more, I think, initially to be the one that was symptomatic, even without the writing just above it. Uh, in our definition of Chiari, we already know, all of us know, that you can't define it just by descent of the tonsils. But the second thing that uh, I think most of us have considered is how much compression there is, as being a, one of the more reliable things to, to, to consider. And the other thing is that Dr. Riquet brings up, of course, seeing other signs of compression and pulling. I can't really see the pituitary on the cell on the, on the one on the right or how much there might be flattening. But, uh, it, you know, all these things have to be considered. And one thing I do want to say is that uh, exertional headache is not as specific as we think either. Uh, and that you have a, you know, if you look at this Venn diagrams, there's, there's, you know, two, three million people in the country with, with uh, some degree of Chiara in descent. And there's a lot of people with headaches, and some of it is even exertional. So, exertional. so there's no question that we don't operate just on the films that we would only consider operating on a person with, with the exertional headaches. But uh, it is a problem because there, there may be headaches even classified as, as exertional which aren't really related uh, to the Chiari. If you see a patient like that with uh, descended peg-like tonsils who's asymptomatic and incidental, what kind of a talk do you have with them? Is there a natural history you project or expectations or what's your long-term follow-up? I don't follow them at all unless they have symptoms. For women, I tell them that they need to let their obstetrician know about this and that it might, I, I would recommend age, and I'd like to hear from other people, the people who matter here, the women in the, in the audience, but I, I, would, I would say that prolonged labor is likely to uh, uh, initiate uh, some, some pain, and so I, I think they can deliver vaginally if carefully observed but a 23-hour uh, uh, labor would probably be a wrong thing. If they've been operated, uh, what's your view on a vaginal labor and delivery? I think they. I think our goal for everyone is to be able to have their own, make their own decisions, and I don't think that, that it should be a problem for 
and if I hear, I would not be surprised that somebody's had a, a problem with, with it, but I don't think that it should be expected. Do you have a formula for knowing who is and isn't symptomatic? Do you have a approach? If they have tufts of headaches and it interferes with their quality of life, and I think that's really important. These are not people who are going to die. These are not people that are going to end up in wheelchairs generally, unless they have syringomyelia. And so they, they were, we're talking about functional neurosurgery. So if it's a matter that it's take, it, it can t be taken care of with um, anti-inflammatories and muscle relaxants, uh, with physical therapy, and now with cannabis, um, I, I would think that that would be better. And I think that rather than becoming dependent on, 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 on narcotics, I would recommend that patient have surgery before starting on the uh, oxycodone. Um, 60,000 people died this last year of drug-induced overdoses. All right, let's... You guys, I shouldn't take the whole thing. Okay. Well, uh, I would be wanting to look for obstruction of CSF flow. I'd want to look for other neurological symptoms, symptoms of you know, cervical medullary syndrome, not, not just headache, there should be dizziness, vertigo, maybe swallowing difficulties. I'd like to see some uh, cranial nerve deficits and some other neurological findings. And if I saw that whole picture, then, uh, and I knew the patient reasonably well, then I'd recommend surgery. How heavily do you weight the CSF flow study? Uh, I used to put, oh, uh, I rarely have made a decision based on a CSF flow study. Most often we can predict what the CSF flow study is going to show by looking at the, the regular anatomy. Uh, sometimes we've, we've done it in a way to be able to compare pre and post just to show there's more flow, but in terms of making a diagnostic decision, I, I don't weigh it very heavily at all. So let's talk about some spinal cord steroids patients. So we have a 14-year-old female with uh, presents with exertional headache, and a continual burning pain in the cape like distribution. And then we have a seven-year-old male, uh, asymptomatic patient who underwent brain MRI because his mother had had a, a history of Chiari. And we have this situation here. And you may not have been surprised by the last one. I wasn't surprised. This one has me a little bit surprised, but it's not the only time that it happens. And let's before we ask some questions, let's look at another case. So here is a 16-year-old with a multi-year history of right neck and arm pain who then develops progressive uh, tuss of headache and then that triggers the primary care uh, physician to obtain an MRI and one can show that it has the tonsils descending through the frame magnum ending in a point and a reduction of CSF signal there flattening of the medulla and then we see a cervical spinal cord serenx. So then this patient then has a hindbrain decompression at a separate institution, had it two years ago, this patient I saw just last week, relief of all symptoms for four months, and then had recurrence of the right arm pain, it's unremitting, it's intrusive, uh, disrupts the quality of daily life, Here's a follow-up image. Shows the uh, frame magnum well decompressed, significant reduction in the syrinx. How do you manage a patient like this? John Heiss has, has published, or his group from NIH has published a, a really fabulous article on focal spinal syringomyelia. Uh, this has some pre syrinx state above and some syrinx below, but um, it's, there's, there, I would get a myelogram on this patient because I think that there's a, a, a focal spinal stenosis at the five, six or six, seven level and that there's some mechanical problem at the five, six or six, whatever, I have to count them to three, four, five, six, seven level. I think there's a, a mechanical problem there. 
And I, then the next step I would do is I'd get an MRI scan of the lower spine, and if uh, if you can f follow the if you can follow the um, the central canal all the way down to the conus, then I, I that to me is a sign of uh, tethered tethered spinal cord, and I'd look for other things like bladder and bowel pro problems and things like that with the idea that uh, maybe something simple like cutting the phylum terminale might be the, the way to go because you can see that the central canal goes all the way down into the, into the phylum terminale. Well, uh, this patient has <coughs> some stenosis at the C4, C5 level. Uh, uh, he also ha oh, she also has degenerative disc disease at every level even though she's only 16 and she's straightening of the cervical spine and these things suggest that she's got a connective tissue disorder and I'll bet you, well I'd say there's a distinct possibility that when she bends her head backward that she's compressing uh, the spinal cord and um, I have numerous cases of patients who had a normal MRI on the standard, on the standard MRI supine, but then on the dynamic flexion extension, they are significantly compressing the spinal cord. So I would get a flexion extension film, and that might be your answer. So what what would you do then, if an extension the ligament and flagrum buckles and pushes into the spinal cord from behind? What would you do? Well, uh, you decompress depending on the characteristics of the spine and whether the compression was worse, you decompress them and stabilize them at that level. But uh, you might be able to do it from the front or, or from the back. Well, just, just for fun, to show with three people, you get three entirely different answers. Uh, and I'm not sure if you, you mentioned uh, head return headaches as well, for example, or just uh, just, just, arm just the arm pain. Well, this may not apply as much. But one of the things that that uh, when I see something where there's a beautiful decompression and even some good hydrodynamic effects, uh, we we look to see if there's some vulnerability in terms of the uh, cerebellar ptosis, even though there's no cranial nerve signs. But uh, sometimes in patients, when you, you push back there, you you know you sense you're pushing around the cerebellum and the, and the spinal cord, and I like to see if any of the symptoms are replicated. With, uh, with motion or with some pressure back here. So you do that in the office? Yeah, I'll, I'll do that right there to see what happens when you do it because a lot of times with good, generous decompressions, we have a little bit too much vulnerability there. And uh, I think that uh, you know, we've had a series of patients where cranioplasty uh, improves people. Not a cervical problem, of course, and that may be uh, the, the case here, but it's another thing that I look at. But, but not for the right arm, though? No, not for the right arm, no. yeah. Um, I guess I was, I guess I want to say wrongs. I, I thought that this would be just an intrinsic tissue injury from, uh, the chron from what is probably a chronic syrinx, and that uh, here we have here a plot of volume reduction of syrinx versus time, and that that is, and that syrinx will reduce over time, but the tissue injury necessarily won't. And I had thought that this would be a case for medical therapy. But I'm going to take what you say and go think it over, maybe call the patient back in for further consultation. The other question I have is, in the first case, I showed an asymptomatic syrinx. How do you advise that patient, asymptomatic and incidental syrinx, in a Chiari? Uh, I have them do, I, I tell them the, the potential course, but also that it may remain asymptomatic. Uh, because I don't want to see uh, too much of a, of, a, of a creation of symptoms. On the other hand, I tell them to have normal activity, uh, except, uh, I guess, high impact sports. I said I wouldn't encourage you know, things like football. Other than that, I encourage regular full activity. So, so was your question how we manage this patient on the left? And, and, yeah. Asymptomatic and incidental yeah. Carry with syrinx. I, follow, I, I have a couple like that. I just follow them year, year to year. And I say, if you begin, and I carefully examine them, and I say, if there's any deterioration, you need to come back and we'll take care of it. But if they're already doing well, it's hard to make them better. <laughs> um, there are a couple of things. Um, first of all, that kind of thing we see a lot in patients who have uh, who, who have um, scoliosis, 
and I would call, if they have scoliosis of a substantial degree, I would definitely um, uh, want, that, want that treated because it can be really a, a, terrible, a terrible thing. I agree that, uh, um, with, with Mark that I would only tell them not to play football and I should probably tell every boy not to play football. Yeah. But, um, sorry for the guy upstairs who is a just professional football player. Um, but I don't see any, re if, you think, if the family is reasonably intelligent, explain to them what the signs and symptoms to worry about are. And that's numbness, that's sensory deficits, and especially the cape-like distribution. It um, could be bowel and bladder dysfunction, it can be scoliosis, it can be the headaches. But if it's a, the, the, now they're aware. I see no value in routine follow-up in a reasonably intelligent family to get scans because you're not going to operate on the MRI anyway unless it, unless there's been a change in the in the now if you want to if you're going to do a full thorough, thorough neurologic exam that that's 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 be a better thing maybe that would be the role that neurologists would play but I I don't think that they really need routine follow-up. What if um, a patient goes to the optometrist for routine uh, eye check and they do an eye test and they find papilledema and they do an MRI and there's a uh, carry malformation. How do you advise that patient? It, it, asymptomatic otherwise. Incidental pickup by the ophthalmologist. So, that's 15% of people with, with Chiari have pseudotumor and 15% of pseudotumor patients have Chiari. So that, that combination is extremely common. It's primarily seen in the obese patients and I recommend uh, bariatric surgery to them. Um, as a pro uh, prophylactic as well as changing life, uh, the value of their life. I, um, I wouldn't uh, be, I'm scared by papilledema untreated. I, I really feel like the, the, the risk of losing vision is just too high. So I would work it out more. I'd get a venogram looking for um, venous stenosis and hoping that there's a stent of holding and then again the most common reason for that thing would be obesity and uh, I would recommend bariatric surgery for that. I gotta say my least happy long-term Chiari patients are those with Cape Light neuropathic pain and so I gotta say I recommended that that be decompressed. But he didn't have it then? Well asymptomatic. That's the only asymptomatic patients in whom I've uh, operated on have been those with syrinx and those with uh, papilledema. So you do a Chiari decompression for papilledema? Uh, if there's no other reason for them to have the papilledema, yeah. Well, that's, that doesn't make any sense. There's papilledema. No, there, the papilledema doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with the Chiari except it makes the brain bigger so it can go down further. It's, it, you're, you've not treated this, the, uh, the, hy the intracranial hypertension. But the papilledema does, at least, I've done it twice, did get better. I've never heard of that happening. This is why we're doing this uh, mode here. <laughs> okay, so the other, uh, I've, so I've taken care of our patients uh, who've had decompression and have persistent symptoms. And I want to show some cases to ask the group about how is a decompression done. Uh, in uh, going over some of the presentations here, people categorize patients as decompressed or non-decompressed, and that gave me, uh, that gave me heartache because uh, those are, that's not a dichotomy here. So we think of Chiari, we think of it, uh, we're trained to think of it in the mid-sagittal plane. Uh, do the tonsils go down below? but it's really a, a three-dimensional compression. Here are two patients with exertional headache, and uh, in the coronal plane, they have remarkably different posterior fossa uh, configurations. Here we have an invagination of the suboccipital bone in the coronal plane, whereas we don't have here. And in some of the patients I have taken care of who've been operated at other institutions, here's an example of a 20-month-old with irritability and ear tugging, arm paresis and gagging after decompression in whom on the mid-sagittal, we can see that the bone is, the frame magnum has been included. 
in the mid-sagittal view. But when you go to the axial view and you look at the bone, it comes there and all the way in to there. And so it seems to me that to do uh, a decompression, one wants to think about it in three dimensions. So uh, I reoperated on this patient here and then took the bony foramen out to the, to the meridian there. And the strategy I've had for doing these decompressions has been to think in terms of what, are the, what is the functional anatomy that limits you? And the main, a big important thing is the vertebral artery and its course there. So during the case, I call out the microvascular Doppler and we'll map out the course of the vertebral artery and we'll take the decompression up to within a few millimeters, avoid the, ton, uh, avoid the condyles. If the tonsil goes below C2, then I'll take the tonsil rather than C2 and almost always use a pericranial graft. I've done a few uh, uh, only bone decompressions and they do recur and I've done reops from others. So I'd like to ask the group then, how do you do the decompression? Is there a way to ground it in science and what's your strategy for it? You want to go first? Uh, <clears throat> if it's a small PRA, I uh, only do a bony decompression and I don't open the dura. And small but is? I go wide. What is small? Uh, well, it's, it's not a lot of compression. And, and I think the length of the Chiari doesn't really always make a great deal of difference. It depends on the size of the frame and magnum and so on. But uh, what I'm trying to establish is normal CSF flow and the absence of posterior compression. But I also uh, always take the decompression out to the meridian as you do, as wide as I can. Uh, I don't use the ultrasound to find where the, I assume I know where the vertebral artery is, and I do it under a microscope. And um, if, if it's a, a, you know, a bigger Chiari, then I do a duroplasty. So every, every case I do is a little bit different and depends on the pathology I'm dealing with. Uh, I agree with the, the uh, lateral issues as well. Uh, one thing that I think is important also is that sometimes we, if we are coagulating tonsils, for example, uh, we don't just do it dorsally, we make sure we've cleared it um, uh, laterally on each side of the spinal cord. Uh, and uh, I think that that's, I think some of the uh, compressions that are made are because that was not done. So I think it's important to, to think about uh, coagulating the tonsils and make sure they are free laterally as well as dorsally. Now, now we've got, we get do all week on, on, the, on, this, on this question. Um, and I don't know, I, this is my second one of these uh, seminars that, I've, that we've had, and there's been one that the CSF uh, did elsewhere as well on cognition in, in Chiari. And I must tell you that the idea that we routinely take the cerebellar tonsils uh, is, is, a, is becoming offensive to me. Uh, is there not a reason that it's there? And if we can, should we not try to spare normal brain? Number one. Number two. Um, uh, based on your previous case, the the, the kid, the 20, 20 month old, they are so different. They they, they do recur because not for, for a number of reasons. The brain's still growing. Number one. Number two is the dura still creates new bone. So the likelihood of a, a recurrence is pretty high in the if you're under three years old and you have a Chiari, and it's not. It's, it, it, I warn the patients that that can, that, that can happen because they, they're a different phys, phys, uh, physiology. So I got an idea from uh, work with the craniofacial people in, in, um, in Europe, uh, both from Rotterdam and from uh, Birmingham, England. The, the, at, um, in Birmingham, they actually, and in Rome too, they actually do cranial expansions, the total cranial expansions, using either um, spring springs or um, we've done these when we put the distractors in. And you do a, a craniotomy from all the way down from here to here and don't, don't, and don't take off the bone. So you lose almost no blood. 
Um, and then you put the distractors in, and over a three month period, you can get multiple centimeters of increased volume in the back of the head. And the, the uh, Goresh Solanke has shown that the, the, literally the tentorium will rise and you'll make the posterior fossa bigger by doing that. And I, I don't think you can do that in adults, but I think it makes complete sense for children, for babies who have Chiaris, because they, they're the hardest ones to treat, I think. It's, it's a very, very hard thing. Now, now we get to the adult. How do I do a Chiari? I do it right. And <laughs> what, that, what I do is different for most people, and I can't get people to, to, to do this. I, I take off the bone, and then I do use the ultrasound, but not for the vertebral artery, but to look for, is there, have I made room for CSF in the back of the brain? I think the, the definition of a successful Chiari is the presence of a cisterna magna. That's, that's the first step. Then I, I um, in, in all of them except the ones that are fused or somehow I've made the ability to make the frame of magnet bigger, I do a, a, a patch, a very patchless patch, and then I take a piece of titanium mesh over the back of it, and I, I sew the, t the, the patch to the back of the, um, of the uh, into, onto the, into the titanium. And what that does is it maintains, no matter what has, uh, happens after that, it maintains the cisterna magna and maintains the flow. So if you develop the pseudomeningocele, it couldn't push it back, push it back in and recreate the Chiari. It, it is protective for certain, for certain things, but that's not why I do it. I do it so that we can be sure on the post-operative MRI scan that there's a, there's a, a cisterna magna. I strongly recommend the use of, the, of some kind of a cranioplasty material in the back when you're doing Chiari 1 malformations as, uh, as, as to protect what you've done, and you've done is to make a cisterna magna. I mean, I just reinforce, I think that's one thing we all agree here, with all these different methods, the purpose is in each individual patient to decompress and also preserve CSF spaces. And I, I don't uh, to open the door in all cases myself, and I agree also with the use of uh, the ultrasound intraoperatively to sometimes assess that. Uh, so uh, in, in our cases, we'll go away from just doing a bony decompression to opening the dura, to doing a plastic, to, uh, to taking down the tonsils. After this conference, the ratio of that may shift a bit as well. But uh, I, I felt that when the tonsils are, are at a certain size and length, that, that, uh, that uh, to feel like I could definitely get a CSF space around it, uh, then, then that would be helpful. I also agree with the, uh, the plasti afterwards. Again, the principle is the same. You're just doing everything you can to m maintain that space. Okay, let's uh, talk about Chiari and hydrocephalus then. Can you take a question from the floor? Oh, I'm sorry, of course. Um, so in, I want in, to. I'm sorry. <laughs> you first. In, in, in watching Bill masterfully open the dura, and seeing this very tight space with nothing happening underneath, to opening it and seeing pulsations and fluids swimming all over. Is that the routine? Is, 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 that, I mean, is that what you do always? Is that the standard practice with, to, to make sure that you're seeing pulsations and stuff? And, and if you haven't done that, you haven't finished? Is that, is that how it works? Well, sometimes you see that with the ultrasound. Uh, and sometimes you have to open the door to make sure, and do a door class to make sure you see that. And decompression. And uh, sometimes you can see the dura pulsating after the decompression without opening it. I, I usually lance the outer layer of the dura, and over time you see the dura expanding as if you had done a duraplasty. But but I, I agree that you need to see that pulsation one way or the other to demonstrate good CSF flow. There's also mechanical pulling down of the, of the cerebellar tonsils. So the, the arachnoid, there are, there are arachnoid bands, uh, and I don't know whether it matters or not, but I make a big deal out of cutting the arachnoid bands that seem to hold, and you see the movement up and down of the, of the cerebellar tonsils more when you've taken the scarring away. Chronic compression will lead to scarring around the cerebellum. Exactly, that was my question. Because one thing that you had discussed are the arachnoid bands and um, what we sometimes see that um, even without a lot of tightness sometimes you open the dura and then you have these arachnoid bands and they go in between the tonsils and then they kind of tend over the obacs 
and um, you know, kind of you think it plugs them. And I, I wonder, I'm not using the ultrasound that much, but I wonder whether this could be missed even when using the ultrasound and you see that there is space, but I wonder whether these, um, whether you would miss or overlook the retinal bands. And I'm asking this because in that girl, which then this morning, she had a lot, a lot of tightness. In fact, the MRI <coughs> was, was more on the lower end, if we can say this. But um, um, after the opening of the dura, she had significant webs and really like an obex web. And uh, I thought, okay, that has affected her cognition. And don't shoot me. I'm just thinking that, uh, not just saying that might be at the end of one, but I'm thinking that the retinoid webs might be involved in impairment of the spinal fluid circulation, and that could potentially be a matter of cognitive defects. And shouldn't we be a little bit more, and that is very provocative, more aggressive, uh, for, for example, to look for those arachnoid webs and not overlook them? Please answer. <laughs> well, I just told you I did that. Uh, okay. But would you then say that we should be, would you then advocate uh, to? It's a very, very, very rare patient that I don't open the dura unless that I can gain, mm -hmm. uh, unless by taking, by doing something to reduce them and fuse them, I can get more room in the, in the frame and magnum so I can be sure that I have a cisterna magna afterwards. So that after an inter inter uh, operative reduction of basilar impression, they have a bigger frame and magnum, then I don't open the dura. But um, I, I essentially open the dura in almost all cases and, um, and take down those arachnoidal uh, bands. And so what's your not? rate of sidum and ingusil? It's pretty high. It's pretty high. So, so one argument on not doing a neuroplasty on everyone is to <coughs> limit the number of sidum and ingusils. That's why I think the surgery I, should I be tapered to the, to the pathology. I completely agree with that. I, but you have to, but, but if we all do reduce and think we've done it best, um, but the, the presence of a cisterna magna, if you don't have a cisterna magna, you, don't, you haven't done the operation. So if you can be sure you're going to have a cisterna <laughs> magna, it's better not to open the, because it definitely decreases the morbidity and, uh, and uh, the fear of the chemical meningitis and all those other things that are, that are so bad. Not opening the dura changes the thing <coughs> from a relative chip shot to a, a really serious operation with, with significant morbidity. And so if, if you're gonna find a way to avoid, and that's one of the things I like about the idea of doing babies with cranial expansion, because you don't have to open the dura in them, you just, they, their dura is expansile, and, they, and they, their head will actually grow. So anything you can do to not open the dura, I completely agree. The problem is I just don't think that I can get a, a cisterna magna without opening the dura in most cases. So I guess it should be noted that there's been meta-analysis on, on this sort of thing, but also that there's an ongoing uh, randomized trial uh, on dural opening versus not opening the dura, I guess, coming out of this. Uh, that that randomized trial is the craziest thing I've it ever is, heard in my life. I it, mean, why it is, in the but world? It just shows that it's a question. It was a brought up through yeah. the Cori mechanism. So it's an important question. It's very, uh, it's controversial, and it's a trade-off between risk and, and opening the CSF spaces, which we all agree is the key. So that's our, our first bullet point that I uh, wanted to see us move toward is, um, is there, some of us use ultrasound, some don't, is there uh, a criterion with high degree of intra-observer reliability that can be, uh, with in a database way, be established and we all agree on? So I think we need to do that before the neuropsychologists can compare decompressed and non-decompressed and before there can be a randomized trial comparing who knows what and who knows what. Yeah, and the other quick point is that to me, a QR decompression in my mind is like an ETV of the frame and magnum. And so if we, I don't know, if we probably won't have time, maybe we'll talk about it at dinner, but for about the past four years I've been uh, working on ways to image uh, pulse wave physiology at a way, way, way less than uh, cardiac frequency. And so a uh, hope is at some point in the future we can ground our decompression in actual hardcore reproducible physiology. All right.
Chiari and hydrocephalus, another one that I don't understand. So I have two cases here. On the left, we have a six month old, presents with head tilt and vomiting, and has some moderate ventricular medulla. Tonsil goes down below the uh, frame and magnum. There's, a residual, there's minimal residual CSF signal at the frame magnum. And on the right, we have an 18 month old, presents with irritability, gross motor delay, and dysphagia, and has a little bit of ventricular medulla, and tonsils go going down. And so, they are referred to the neurologist, many, many, de, uh, many referrals, many consults. Their symptoms are slowly progressive, which in my mind, a slowly progressive symptom uh, with no other satisfactory explanation puts them in my mind into the consider decompression category. So these are two cases that I decompress with two different outcomes. So the one on the left, the ventricular medulla gets worse, they develop a, a mening, pseudomeningocele that's somewhere between full and outright tense. And the one on the right, at follow-up, uh, the ventricular megaly goes away. So on the left one, I treat with a, a, a VP shunt. And so then the questions are then, what is the basic science relation between Chiari and hydrocephalus? And if you have a patient with ventricular megaly and a Chiari, who you think is symptomatic, what do you do? Who do you treat first? Do you treat the Chiari first? Do you treat the CSF, ETV, shunting? What's your, you Petra, how do you think about these? Uh, well, um, I have to say, I look a little bit at the anatomy of the ventricles. For example, um, if the ventricles, <coughs> For, uh, for example, in a kid, uh, look for like huge and uh, it looks more like a long-standing uh, pediatric hydrocephalus. Um, and I, I assume this is, is not really causing the carry. I think that kid has um, two coexisting entities and um, I would then probably just based on the sympt symptomatology treat the carry. So you make out the other first earlier slide. So uh, there should be, if there's a mismatch between ventricular megaly and uh, Chiari, um, I would say uh, I would treat them separately. But then of course what first, but that would be based on symptomatology. If there's uh, indication that it's um, more of a salva induced headaches, I would treat the Chiari and not so you make two judgments, the, the relative degree of morphological severity, yes. and in your mind you categorize the symptoms which is more compatible with Correct. which? All hydrocephalus is obstructive. There isn't any real such thing as communicating hydrocephalus except by Dandy's criteria, but the, in a Chiari 1, one has to assume that the, that the, um, that the lat that maybe the frame of Mugendi is closed, that the one, the midline is closed, and that that uh, is, is problematic, and that's, but in a baby, that would end up with syringomyelia as part of the, as part of the problem, too. So we have to, in this case, in, the, in both these cases, you have to assume that the spinal fluid can get out um, through the foramen of, of Lushka. And so, you know, I would say that both of them, the hydrocephalus caused the Chiari. That the symptoms of the first case were most, um, were, were worse, um, it'd be worsened by the fact that it created the Chiari, which, which is like, just like having a brain tumor, which leads to a head tilt. When you, when you herniate one cerebellar tonsil more than another, it ends up with a, with a, with a, with a head tilt. Um, so, um, you know, I, I would have, I, I probably would have shunted that patient instead of, um, instead of, and I think that, that it's, it's, um, and I think that the symptoms would have resolved. If they didn't resolve quickly, I would do a decompression as well. And I would have predicted just what happened uh, in that situation. The second, the second one um, is, um, same, the, sort of the same thing. The, 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 there's a septum pellucidum cyst, as well as the enlarged, enlarged ventricles. Um, so they, these two might be um, 
true, true, and unrelated. Uh, but it looks like a very large cerebellum filling this, filling the space. Mm -hmm. and, um, I think that uh, the hydrocephalus isn't bad enough, and the symptoms are not clearly enough uh, to to say that it's the, it's the hydrocephalus. So I probably would have done a decompression in hopes of not having to. Uh, an 18-month-old shunt is a, it's not a shunt; it's a sentence. And I, anything I can do to prevent shunting a patient, I will do that first. I think, you know, in an ideal world, uh, we would hope to have the imaging which would give us a clue as to where the obstruction is, if there's a good chance that decompression uh, will resolve any, any uh, fourth pinch of bowel flow obstruction. I think very often it's just difficult, sometimes clear when there's aqueductal stenosis, that it's a separate phenomenon. Uh, given that the, uh, the missing of a hydrocephalus that's independent and cannot be resolved by compression, you know, I, I agree, I, I, I've done a decompression with that. It was Chiari symptoms, I didn't see any obstructions uh, upstream. Uh, but I would do that rarely because I think uh, having a, a, a residual hydrocephalus afterwards, having the CSF uh, meningocele seal and so forth, is enough of a consequence that I would, I would treat the hydrocephalus generally first. Uh, one other point, I, I think you're right to do the hindbrain decompression on the patient on the left because the frame of magnum looks very narrow anyway. And so you would have had to do that regardless. Uh, so Dr. Rike, when you talk, spoke about the titanium plate, uh, I thought to myself, ah, shucks, that's what I should have done on the left. Because one of the interpretations I had was pseudomenina seal back pushing on, on the back of the tonsil. Exactly, that's and what I, this stops from happening. And so in fact, this may have been on the left inadequately treated Chiari, and that the, and the shunting was a compensatory uh, treatment. Okay. Uh, asymptomatic Chiari, ventricular magaly, any thoughts there? You can't make it better. <laughs> <laughs> a little hydrocephalus may be good for you. <laughs> I, um, I, 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 in children especially, I do not I, I, I would let the ventricles get fairly big, quite big, before I would, uh, if, they're, if they're developing normally and they're, they're asymptomatic, I, I, I let them get big heads and I talk to the families. And that takes more talking than anything else I do, I think, is to talk a family out of the fact that they, they've been sent to me emergently to have a shunt and uh, they go home without one. Is it, uh, in your mind, actually true that uh, untreated Chiari has an elevated risk of mortality with minor motor vehicle accidents no. and the like? No? Unless it's that one. <laughs> ah. Can I ask a question? Yes. You first. So asymptomatic Chiari. Mm -hmm. What symptoms are you referring to as not being present? That's why you're the here. <laughs> <laughs> so that's part of uh, that's part of what this is about. Is that in my mind the disease is not that well defined, and it may well be that what we're calling asymptomatic Chiari, we would find um, uh, problems in the cerebellar neuropsychiatric scale or cognitive affective, affective scale, uh, and that's why in my mind the, the disease itself is very nebulous. Um. For example, in a, in a child um, with asymptomatic Chiari and hydrocephalus, um, I don't know whether I haven't done it for adults, but I um, sent them to Christine for uh, neuropsychiatric testing to make sure that they are okay. Because what, what uh, Jeremy just said, what are we considering asymptomatic? But if we now think in the realm of cognition and, and embracing that as a symptom, we have to check that out. Um, I don't know what other things. Well, I, mean, I, I wish that I had pediatric neuropsychology and, uh, and uh, able to see all of the patients that I do. I, I, I wrote in, uh, in 1985 that, the, that when, uh, this was about the myelomeningocele patients uh, who we were clearly shunting way too many of. That was, that's been proved by the, um, by the MOMS trial in the Tim Chiari 2s. And um, so what I did was I, had we had pediatric in case at Case Western in Cleveland we had uh, pediatric neuropsychology and 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 they worked with developmental pediatrics to make me say is is are the upper extremities and the personal social skills uh, adequate and are they are they going at the right level and if they are I wouldn't shunt them uh, and even with the fairly large large ventricles and I think that 
colleagues like that are immeasurable in how important they are in making these decisions. And for an adult, just like you say, I send um, the chronic compensated hydrocephalus people to, uh, to neuropsychology and have a, to get a baseline and see whether there's something that I'm missing. Uh, I, I think that's a really important thing. The problem is, um, in, in Phoenix anyway, the problem was that um, the ones that existed, they were so, uh, it, it took a year to get into them, uh, to, be, to be seen, and, and that was too long to be able to help to have them help make the decisions. There's so few uh, people who are interested in that, it's, it's a tough, tough sell. It, it has to be supported in an academic environment. So uh, on the question of Chiari, but it's not really Chiari, but it presents like Chiari, are other anomalies of the uh, cranial vertebral junction. So for example, on the left, we have a six-month-old who knows with snoring, aspiration, vomiting, has a gastrostomy. Uh, and uh, the gastroenterologist uh, obtains neuroimaging. And by the way, in my town, I'm on a first name basis with the gastroenterology of my institution, Boston Children, and Tufts. A lot of these children present with various gastroenterological things that at the end of a workup, they do an MRI. Has this, has this case here, that image there, and um, as part of a jaw CT scan, has the bottom left CT scan showing C1. So we see widely open synchondroses, uh, midline posteriorly and anteriorly, and has that. So my question that I faced, and I wasn't sure how to answer, and I thought I'd throw it out to the group, is in this case here, if you believe, as I did, that that was the root symptomatic neurologic thing, how do you factor in C1 synchondroses into a decompression that will span C1? Or do you? No? Well, I'm not sure what the, it, it looks, you know, I, I, I think we would need, um, I would want a, a 3D reconstruction of what the cranial vertebral junction looked like. It looks to me like there's a occipitalization uh, issue um, with the posterior, de posterior uh, small frame, frame of magnum, um, and that's a, and this is a six month old. I, I, they, they definitely need decompression. I think from behind, they, you, 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 you're, there's almost pithing himself. Um, I, I asked this because this is another uh, infant patient who I did a posterior decompression who also had a synchondrosis. I did a C1 laminectomy. And over about a year and a half, patient developed a head tilt, and the lateral mass of C1 went further and further and further and further apart. And on that imaging, that patient was behaving uh, biomechanically as if she had a Jefferson fracture, a multi-ring fracture through C1. So when I saw this patient here and had synchondrosis uh, deficits, I thought to myself, is there a lesson to be learned? Does anyone else recognize this? Do anything about it? Do you factor it in at all? Well, the problem is fusing. The, the treatment would be to, to fuse occiput to C3, I think. And um, doing that in a six-month old is as big a challenge as anybody could deal with. And um, it probably would fail. So um, trying to give the child uh, time by just doing the decompression and watching closely um, uh, and expecting that you will find it in the instability to be a problem and wait till they're three when you can actually do a fusion um, uh, and try to get them through that tongue, I think would be the way to go. Yeah. And then on the right, then we have um, a posteriorly de decompressed patient who has a retroflex dent. And this is a post decompressed. Uh, some, however, are pre-decompression, and a significant degree of the compression is from anteriorly. So a question I wanted to throw out to people is, are there occasions in which you do an anterior decompression, and how do you decide that? Uh, I, 
I used to do a lot of transoral decompressions, but um, starting around 2000, I, I began doing uh, intraoperative reductions uh, and the combination of traction and extension and straightening of the clivoaxial angle. And then stabilization eliminates the deformative stresses on the front of the brainstem. So uh, it's very seldom now that I do a transoral. Um, I think that 95, or 90% of those could be handled with intraoperative traction. And uh, uh, Santiago, actually the paper you did tell, uh, in publishing uh, 2004, I talked about intraoperative reduction to straighten the clavoax angle, and they had excellent results in nine out of the 10 cases, and probable results in the other one. Yeah, we haven't done a, a, tra a transoral, I haven't done a transoral for those kinds of problems since about 2005. And um, it's, it, these are always reducible. Uh, and uh, if you can straighten that angle, you can take pressure off. It, it turns out you can overstretch it too, and then they get a, a adjacent segment problems. But um, so if, and, and that's, the one, that's the one group of patients that I don't open the dura in the decompression. I actually do the, the bony only, bone only decompression so I have enough bone so that I don't have to get a, a, a graft from the rib or, or from the hip. Um, and, and the bone is a great thing for fusions, the skull bone. So you, you straighten it out uh, interoperatively and, um, and then fuse in that position. We use, a, you need interoperative imaging. Uh, Arnold Menezes uses a CT scan. Um, an O-ring would be perfect. Uh, for us, we have an ISO C, but you need to be able to be sure that you've taken, and uh, we use interoperative ultrasound, and we can actually show that the brain is no longer kinked. Okay, airway disorders, carry and airway disorders. So we have two patients, a five year old with chronic cough, uh, has falls, and the swallow study shows aspiration. And then the bottom, we have four-year-old choking liquids, dry foods, projectile vomiting, snoring, apneic episodes, cardiac right mobile four, full, small study, no aspiration. Has some element of deformity on the suboccipital bones, a little bit horizontal there, uh, but no pegging, and the axial um, T2 image shows residual CSF. On this one here, it does not show any. And um, questions here then are, do you treat GI and airway disorders in a special way? Or let me ask, phrase that differently. What are the criteria you use to recommend a decompression for a child with uh, a GI or uh, an airway disorder? The, 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 the interesting thing about that is that this is a this is a perfect. Um, this is almost all dwarfs have some of this. The the a dwarf has a very small frame and magnum, and they don't they don't have a PRA because they don't have enough room to get the spare cerebellum down. And the uh, there's a there's a, a a subset of of achondroplastic dwarfs who die in the first year of life because of these problems of the aspiration and the inability to. And, it sh and the, the way they're evaluated at, uh, at Hopkins, uh, if anyone knows where that is, um, that they, when they, who has the largest population of uh, it's the little people of America are right there, um, they um, do somatosensory evoke potentials and, um, and, uh, uh, and um, do the visualization of the, um, of, of the vocal cords and, um, and a sleep sleep study, and if any of those are, are abnormal, they recommend, a, at least they did when I last looked at it, they were recommending a deep, uh, a, making the frame and magnum bigger. So I think that's probably a bone problem, not a Chiari problem, and that a, a bony decompression in this situation would be the ideal way to do it. Last question. Uh, that four-year-old child, did she get better after you decompressed her? Uh, she had... Um, her projectile vomiting went away. No, her vocal four full and projectile vomiting went away, but not the apneic episodes and not the snoring. So is there a cause and effect? 
I want to say that there is, but I don't really know. Or maybe the damage is too far gone. Well, it's also a very straight cloud of actual angle, and which makes me think that maybe, and it's a deformed looking posterior fossa. I mean, did she have a connective tissue disorder? I mean, um, I, there, it, uh, she has a sister with hyper, her sister has hypermobility, but she does not. So I'm calling that no. You have to be to at least 10 before you could actually make that call, but it's an interesting idea. It looks to me like there's a small posterior fossa there, right? Too. You brought up somatosensory, does anybody do intraoperative uh, somatosensory motor potentials? Well, Why? On all of them. On everybody. So Dr. Luciano said no, you said on all of them. All of them. Why? Um, well, the, uh, there have been, there's been one case, uh, and you're always, it's, 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 to, to make a decision based on one case out of hundreds is, is a bad thing, but in one case, the the uh, leg evoked potentials uh, went out. Two cases actually. One was while positioning. The, we lost we, in going from supine to prone. We lost the evoked potentials, the somatosensory evoked potentials. And this, in the second uh, case, we lost unilaterally. We lost um, uh, the um, evoked potentials on the right side, and. Um, that patient, it turned out, I, I opened the, I, I had put in a patch and spent a long time getting it right, and I opened it up and there was a clot in there. So, you know, why not, why is not the answer, why not? It, it, unless, uh, it, it, it adds a few minutes, it, it adds a lot of money, but that's not out of your pocket. So, uh, you know, the health planners may want us not to use the potentials, but I want to use them. I use them routinely. Just coming from um, from my experience with um, uh, back and uh, with Professor Sammy, we did um, monitoring for every posterior fossa procedure because of an N of one, um, uh, and so I I feel like not seeing what I need to see while positioning the patients without the SSCPs. So. I, I think it also gives you physiological evidence. Of what you're working on, if you see a very delayed brainstem of a potential latency or delays in the cervical or lumbar. I use it on every spine case. If it's in the thoracic spine or I'm taking out a spinal cord tumor, then I'll also do motor books. I guess I, I initiated that out of those cases, but, but having found not that in one, uh, we, we basically stopped in the last maybe 10 years or so. Uh, uh, I'm just saying in a case where obviously there's, there's more compression, and you know, that door that some existing uh, concern you would not so use it, but I, I've not used it routinely at all in years. Yeah, I don't use it either, except in the achondral plastics, I've used them, but, and I don't even know why in them. Well, they're fragile big creatures. Moving the head and positioning can be very trying in those patients with a big head. Uh, does the presence of an airway disorder factor into how you do this? Do the decompression? No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Chiari and gastrointestinal disorder. And so there's upper GI and lower GI. And this one here is interesting to me because as I've seen this presentation a few times. I want to see what other people think. Six-year-old, toilet trained at age three, then develops ankle creases, constipation, humiliated at school, uh, seldom has bowel movements, has the underwear stained, smells. Long workup, MRI, and has this. Anyone else seen this before? Sure. Yeah? Sure. Yeah, okay. And in my mind, it's uh, a test of headache equivalent in a patient who can't quite put it into words and that they, it hurts to them to sit and go. I formulated it that way. I don't know if that makes sense to anybody. Well, I'd almost, I'd have to have more information than we have now, but I'd probably do a tether cord release in that patient. Okay, I had tethered cord cases, but I don't think I put them in there. 
anyway, so that's what I wanted to present. And um, so for me, it's a situation of maximal humility uh, because and I see the disease not that well defined. And so for pediatric children, if they have intractable airway problems, GI symptoms, or anything vaguely referable to the brain stem, negative diagnostic evaluation, significant quality of, of uh, disruption quality of life, slow progression of symptoms, that's generally when I do it in. That sound reasonable to everybody? Absolutely. Yeah? And um, as part of the maximal humility strategy, the approach is do your work, do your diligence, listen to the patient fully, uh, listen to the parents, make a reasonable decision, execute it well, and always have a plan for failure because the disease in my mind is just well enough, Ill, insufficiently well understood for one to really have a system that always works. The only thing I'd add to that is the, um, the, the, the process of autonomy. I, I, um, I think that uh, for the most part, these are not life-threatening conditions and that um, it's a quality of life issue and, and the parent is the, is the proper um, uh, person to make the decision. So my job is only to tell them what's gonna happen, what's likely to happen, what could happen, and, and tell them what, answer all their questions, listen to them, but then at the end of the day, uh, unless the child is really going down fast, I would, I would want the parents to make an informed decision. So autonomy, I would put into that. All right, Petra. So I was distracted for a second. <laughs> um, so for, regarding uh, what you said, is um, uh, I agree with what Hal said, but I would say I would translate that to also the adult population. Um, um, the um, uh, the autonomy, I think. Is, is really very important. Um, and here you learn your lesson. Um, because um, whatever you think, you cannot just walk in and take the autonomy way applies to any patient, but uh, particularly to a patient with a chronic disorder, where um, I think we doctors have to learn the art and making uh, and, and helping the patient to decide for him or herself, but also giving the patient the instruments. So I do agree that this is very important in, in helping to make the decision. But the humility is, I think, a nice wor word um, uh, that applies to, uh, to us, and I like it, the way it applies to us. But it would not only apply to the pediatric, but to all patients. What percent of your carry patients end up getting treated for a tethered cord? Um, uh, five. Five percent. You mean that patients with carry? Uh, um, 10%. I would say less than five. Yeah. yeah, I'd say, yeah. Okay, I think these are the case questions I wanted to go through. Shall we maybe ask the panel whether they want to say a word? Anything else? I think goes along with what we're talking about, about autonomy, and also the idea of what is asymptomatic. Uh, what if as a result of, of our uh, new and exciting explorations into the the cerebellar effects, we, we look at cognitive affective disorders as we should. Uh, and we have a family coming to us with a Chiari reaching the anatomical criteria uh, with some compression. And the only symptom they have is what the mother of the child or maybe the patient themselves reports as a cognitive issue. Or maybe even we have some, a test which is consistent with some cognitive delay, which may be related or, or can be associated with uh, cerebellar syndrome. Uh, when are we uh, prepared to, to use that as a guide? And if we say, well, this, like you were saying, these are elective or functional cases, to say, is this uh, serious enough for us to do an, an operation which has risks? And then uh, talking about autonomy, what if the patients uh, insist or uh, that uh, they have cognitive deficits, uh, they've, they've read about it, they know that this can occur with Chiari, uh, and they want the surgery. But I guess what I'm getting at is there's millions of people out there with, with Chiari malformation. And there's uh, probably tens of millions that may, may perceive that they or their child has a cognitive deficit. 
So we have to be very careful about those two large groups of patients uh, uh, coming together in, in, in non-causative ways. I would, I would add on that, if you look at Doug Buckmeyer series and Clay Camp series, 20% of those children who had decompressions also had instability and had to go back. And if you can recognize that ahead of time and take care of both at the same time, it might save them some distress in the second surgery. Jeremy, you must have been thinking about that question. Yeah, I think about first, yeah, I love that discussion. Thank you all for really uh, teaching yeah, us right. about, about you know, how, yeah. how neurosurgeons address yeah. these and, and also for blowing away the stereotype of, of the, uh, you know, the know-all, arrogant neurosurgeon. I'm, I'm, I'm my heart. <laughs> all kinds of good to see the care and the thought that, that you all put into this, and it really is a teaching experience for all of us. Thank you. Um, I, I think it's, a, it's an important question because I think truly we don't yet know the answer. So in the two patients that I presented at the beginning of the day, you know, they wouldn't really fit criteria for Chiari malformation in the way that you would think. And so we approached them, both of them, very gingerly. First one, we had to sort of find a reason to operate. And the second one, I made it very clear to them that this may do nothing, but if you're doing this procedure, we need to study you because we need to have some information about it. So I, I imagine that we would probably want to have an understanding of mechanism so that if you're trying to make the case that you don't have a malformed cerebellum, it's not kind of a you know, as like in Baltzhauser talks about a disruption or there's a genetic disorder that produces a, a deformed cerebellum. It's not that kind of thing. With, but you know, all you have is this, all the criteria that, that you in neurosurgery would think would be appropriate for saying this is a very tight situation down there that, that could respond to surgical intervention. And they have this syndrome, this, this constellation of neurobehavioral phenomena. Is that enough? Um, I would, I would think that as we go through this, it would be important to define the mechanism in such a way that we could then come back, or circle back at some point, and then use the now defined mechanism as a diagnostic test of our clinical reasoning. Uh, whether that diagnostic test would be you know, a functional MRI or task-based MRI or some kind of diffusion tractography or or some measure on imaging that maybe will come up with. But some, it would be nice to have some special investigation to back us up with the clinical hypothesis generation that we have. But I think if you take the two cases from the start of the day, both of whose lives, when the mother, the mother's email at midnight last night says, I can't believe how close we came to losing this kid. And then you see him in a, in a kayak on, on the ocean a month later. So I think we have to listen to that, but your caveat is, is spot on. I mean, if you start getting involved with the charlatans in imaging who are diagnosing concussion in every person who's jumping into a, a, a DTI scan uh, and the lawyers getting involved, one can see a very dark side of this conversation. And I think we have to be, to be heedful of your, of your question and be cautious, uh, rigorous and, uh, and humble uh, to, to pick up on as we go forward to trying to define uh, the extent of this phenomenology and how to go about managing it. Dr. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to I was gonna ask Dr. Allen, uh, did any reactions on your part and how this correlates to your findings on neuropsychiatric outcomes and then the relationship between uh, the functional outcomes and the pain scales? Maybe one out of 10 to one out of 30 of the people with the morphometric and anatomical uh, characteristics of crowding and stuff have the severe symptoms. And I think that suggests that there's at least one other factor. And my suspicion is that it is reactivity to a pro-inflammatory response, but I personally think that's just another 
word that doesn't explain why. So why do a subset of patients that look, or even with less symptoms, in, in some of the examples you get, show these terrible uh, behavioral symptoms? And uh, I, I think the cognitive stuff is derived from something else, not just the anatomical part. And I think we're just starting to look at that right now. And I'm afraid that doesn't solve your problem, but I'm, what I'm saying is you can't just go on anatomy either. Uh, I, I think that's true, although I think there are still questions with the anatomy, such as DTI studies and so forth, to try and correlate and see yeah. if there is a rational. And I think it, it obviously is very important to get the mechanism here straight so we can make that decision about a, a real relationship uh, to the symptoms or, or not. So. The, the, important, the important thing, and I think that uh, Mark and Dorothy and the CSF people that are putting together this, Corey, these things and trying to get the data are vitally important because there's so much skepticism. And, and I hear skepticism here, and I understand skepticism. Any disease that doesn't have a biomarker is going to have skepticism that you're doing something that doesn't need to be done. You, and our patients are usually good looking as well as smart. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, makes, it makes it even more difficult because the doctor looks at them and says that there's nothing, nothing wrong with you and that there's no biomarker to prove it. A, a really compelling case for me is a, um, I've learned from Frazier, I learned from Tom Millerot about the importance of uh, connective tissue disorders in, in, in TRs. And they, come to, they came to me in droves after I took over from Tom Millerod with, uh, they couldn't get out of bed. They would faint immediately after they, they couldn't perform with their, um, they, they had cognitive decline. They couldn't, they couldn't work. All of these things, they had horribly terrible chronic fatigue. And they all had instability at the cranial verbal junction, which most neurosurgeons in the United States don't believe is a problem. <coughs> really, you can't find. And now, uh, now that now that I'm going to be retiring in December, and uh, and uh, Fraser doesn't do children anymore, it's almost impossible to get anybody under 18 to have a, a fusion like that. So we we, we did our group. I I, I got an uh, IRB approval to look at. <coughs> these patients prospectively, and, and we got 18 or 19. It was surprising how much people did better with, the, uh, with their POTS, with their um, dysautonomia, with their abdominal pain. And it was, uh, you know, it's always been a Chiari thing. Well, um, the, the Bobby Lighthouser was on the Today Show with, with how all of these symptoms got, got better after his, his uh, decompression infusion. And I still haven't been able to convince anybody. Um, uh, the, the, the word from um, uh, the, the, is that of things in science, you can't ever commit, you ever can't convince anyone. So what you do is get the word out, and the young people will survive, and the old will die off, and eventually they'll, you'll, they'll find an answer to this thing. So Willie, her name is Willie Julianne, came to me with her father, and she had all of the symptoms that Lighthouser had. The, the, she had a G tube, she had a, a IV, she had to give herself IVs before she could get out of bed in the morning. She couldn't uh, leave the house, essentially. And she was in miserable, uh, horrible pain. And she had what I consider uh, instability at the cranial vertebral junction, and I don't know if we completely agree, but we're in general agreement about that. And she came to me and she said, but you fused him and he got better. And I said, but you don't have a Chiari. That's why I fused him. Uh, that's why I treated him, is because of the Chiari. So I went, I, I said, well, I have to get some sink. And after the next three patients did, did well after that, I, I got an IRB approval to do her, essentially, as an experiment. And she's living an absolutely normal life two years later. And she didn't have a Chiari at all. She just had this instability with, with, a, with a, a crank, this cervical medullary syndrome, which I now uh, believe in. And, uh, and, and Frazier was the person who, uh, who coined that term. 
But all of her symptoms of dysautonomia, of her abdominal pain that was just awful, got, got better. So I think it's now justified to use just the instability at the cranial vertebral junction and dysautonomia as a reason to do surgery. I think that we've got so much data from the Chiari people that it's, 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 and you see the outcomes of them. So what we, what's lacking now is, is a real attempt to get all of that data from a lot of patients so that we know how quickly we can move to, to increase the level of uh, acceptance of, of a new observation. I was very impressed with you, that wasn't it, that said that uh, we, we, we have to be open to new ideas and to, to look at new things that we haven't seen before and, and, and look at them fresh again. And I think that's absolutely vitally important. And, and Willie taught me something that I really, really needed to hear. And, um, and I think that's, that's the way things are going to go. And I think with the cognitive issues, we have so many of these patients that have cognitive dysfunctions so that if we can keep the data together and have those questions answered by the patients in all of our different practices, then we'll know that maybe it's worthwhile to, to expand the um, under some controlled conditions, I think it may be reasonable to use cognitive reasons as a reason to do the surgery. And I, uh, to that, I just wonder if we can ask a question of you all. If you had an opportunity, as you do, to, to speak to four or five neurosurgeons who, who deal with, I guess five are here, who deal with uh, Chiari malformation, how can we help uh, doing what we do to further the, our understanding of, of cognition and Chiari? I mean, we, we get direct observations, we can make intraoperative physiological measurements, we can give tissue, uh, we can test before and afterwards. Uh, I guess uh, you know, we're all interested in, in this dimension and uh, we want to, to help with this. And so if you can think of, of ways of collaboration or, or different angles, uh, I think we'd all be open to it. For us, I think, adding on to that, it, it, it's really hard to get full-time uh, neuropsychologic testing on patients, um, the, and ins and insurance being what it, what it is, and the bureaucracy being w what it is. Is it possible to pare down and focus on these things so that they can be done? Uh, and I know you're trying to do that, but I, I encourage that, that we need to, we need to pare it down so that it can be done by a nurse practitioner um, uh, in, in, in the office rather than having to get a developmental pediatrician or, uh, because there's just not enough people who can do these prolonged neuropsychologic testing. So I, I, you know, I'm uh, ecstatic to hear the response um, of the field and working with Bill and, and talking to Petra and, and, and you all about where this is going. I think the answer is yes to all of that, like the collaboration across centers, um, uh, the interest is, is there. Uh, we're going to actually initiate exactly that. And I think that uh, having a, a screening instrument, which we've now devised, uh, with further testing as necessary, is the way to go. And uh, it's not cost effective, and it's certainly in the current environment, to send someone to neuropsychology for the whole day, and it's not going to happen because you haven't got the personnel. So I think we, we have the wherewithal now to do that. And that was in large part what drove, what drove the work. Uh, I think it's possible to get much more information between that and the, the uh, bring in the, the, young, the young, bright minds as we're doing you know, across, the, across the country to work with us to look at mechanisms, um, I think is going to be essential. And the flip side of not over-diagnosing is missing the diagnosis of the two kids that I presented this morning and others, the ones that Fraser had talked about earlier, uh, just a, a, at dinner last night and, and a year ago in, in San Diego. Uh, the question that, that arises, which is a very provocative question, is how much of psychiatry, as in psychiatric disease in uh, mental institutions, is amenable to a surgical intervention of some kind such as this? So it's an, un, uh, an unasked question. Once, the, once the, that Pandora's box is open, who knows where it's going? But uh, there is one of, the, one of the great scourges of a sophisticated society as ours is mental illness. Um, it's very common and it's underdiagnosed and it's mostly undertreated. How much of this is hiding in diseases that may actually be amenable to surgical intervention? So it's, uh, you know, I don't know where that's going, but it's, it's, a, it's a question that can be addressed 
and hopefully we'll be addressed as we go. And this will be an example of it. A couple. Other things you could do is sometimes there are tissues and fluids that you can collect during surgery in small amounts that could let people link the anatomical part to maybe microglia and stuff like that. And I think another thing that I've really seen almost nothing done on is trying to get people to donate their brains to science with Chiari that when they pass away that we can do uh, very comprehensive autopsies on the brains in a way that we can't do when, when they're alive to make some of these linkages to the cognitive and neuropsychiatric components in a more definitive manner. I don't know about this gentleman, but my average age is 22. And um, I got my great grandparents, great grandchildren are going to have to actually pull that data. The other piece of this, and I, I, uh, we actually will do something along this line. Bill Dobbins, who's one of the country's uh, premier uh, geneticists of cerebellar hindbrain malformations, has, a, has an interest in actually looking at this. So is there a common genetics behind the Chiari malformation? I, I think the answer is going to be no, but the question can be looked at uh, using exome in a cross cross-section of Chiari patients, and that's something that hopefully with the uh, foundation health will be able to move forward and do. Um, at Akron, there's uh, Leah. Leah is a, a PhD with a mass spectrometer at the University of Akron, and uh, we've been sending her CSF samples interoperatively obtained in our, in our Chiari patients, and um, we've not been able to find a lot of normals to um, to use this, uh, this uh, and they can, if she's doing metabolomic studies, so she takes the CSF, and um, we have, we've, we've done all of the patients that IRB will, will let us do for, for the, for the, but we haven't cracked the code because we don't have the five normals, um, and they were suited to her patients, so they're not really normal. So that's, the, that's but that, that, the idea that we could find a biomarker or a genetic, uh, it wouldn't be one genetic thing. It may be a lot of different genetic things. We need, we need the, uh, we need the, now we have the ability to have relatively cheap, relative to lots of things, genetic um, uh, genome things. I, I think we should really try very hard to re reignite that, that story. I've, I have, uh, I've sent three families with multiple family members uh, for analysis at the Yale Center for Mendelian Genetics. So there is maybe a little small growing database in, in that respect. But um, I don't think familial association, I have the uh, intuition that it's not that common. Yeah, it's, it's because there's so many different forms. The, the patients that, uh, if you took the patients that, that Fraser and I see, it's almost at least 70% of the patients have the genetic, uh, the genetic cause of their, of their, because they have the connective tissue disorders. I, I don't know about you, but that's, that's at least my, that one, the number of my practice. And um, they, they're really interested. I have three sets of uh, identical twins um, who have different presentations in, in, in this situation. And uh, I mean, it would be amazing to have to be able to figure those those, those people out. It, it, it's really, I wish I could live another 50 years so that I could uh, see the uh, see how this uh, flower grows. How do you de how do you define cranial vertebral instability? So what if you could put that slide up which with the with the one where the the, the MRI scan had been done and. It took a year, a year and a half for Mark and, and the team to, to put this together. There are measurements that are all accepted. And what, what you do, you have a, a Mark uh, thing. Um, original, or, originally, uh, Paul Grab at Alabama uh, defined instability having to do with the um, distance between the base of the skull and the back of C2, and then drawing a line perpendicular to it to the highest point in that mountain. And, and if, it's, if it's more than nine millimeters, then that is, is 
definitive evidence of, of instability. The angle that you see between the base of the skull and the odontoid process there, here to here, that angle here is going to be about 115 degrees. And any, any angle that's, um, that's less than 135 degrees is clearly abnormal. But what I do is, I, and all, anybody that, I have that, that has abnormal Baten scores, which are the hypermobility things, or have suspicions because of the fact that they hate going driving in a car because they don't want to be bumped, uh, those kinds of those kinds of things, I get flexion extension MRI scans on them, and you, that movement should only be about 10 degrees to change um, with flexion and extension. And if it's more than that, then that's I think indicative. Yeah. Were you going to mention the Harris measurement? No, I wasn't. Well, let, let, let me mention the Harris. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, Harris uh, looked at about 600 skulls, and, thank you. and he measured the distance uh, between the posterior axial line here and the basion. And the distance between the basion and the posterior axial line was 12 millimeters or more. He said that is unstable. That's a horizontal uh, Harris. And he said if the, dis if the vertical distance between the odontoid and the basion was more than 12 millimeters, that was unstable. But then there's several other people, um, like uh, White Punjabi and, uh, and Weasel and, uh, and a few people earlier, that said that between flexion and extension, the basion should not move with respect to the odontoid. It should pivot. The skull should pivot over the top of the odontoid. And if that's moving more than one or two millimeters, that's unstable. So if you measure the Harris measurement in flexion, and this is actually probably a neutral view of slightly flexed, and then you measure it in extension. If this basion moves back, you know, five or six millimeters, that's that's a four times, four or five times the normal range of motion of the basion with respect to the odontoid, and that constitutes uh, craniocervical instability as well. Now, the caveat is that I have many patients who clearly have craniocervical instability. It does not necessarily mean they need surgery. They have to have the rest of it. The headache, the neurological, the correct neurological symptoms, the neurological findings, the failure to improve with physical therapy, as well as the radiological findings. And if, you, if your patient is of the age two, three, or four, so that they need oh. general anesthesia for MRI, how do you well, assess them? Well, children are a lot more hypermobile, these measurements were made in adults, so, uh, I mean, in an adult, you see here you'd say, well, this, uh, I mean, not only is there a problem with the odontoid here, but the ALR ligament here is clearly incompetent, but the problem is in children, all, all of the ligaments are hypermobile, and, and so it becomes much more difficult in children to uh, determine uh, craniocervical well, it's true that finding, it's real, defining whether it's unstable or not is, is more difficult because it looks unstable in a lot of them. That's exactly true. But if there, if there are symptoms, especially GI symptoms or swallowing symptoms, and they have a, a kink in the brainstem, uh, inflection, I, I think that's good enough. Yeah, you have to put it all together. Yes. It's a great discussion. So um, thank you all for a great day. Can I, can I, I'm sorry, can I, I <laughs> yes. know you have the one, I, I, I think there's a 500-pound okay. gorilla in the room that hasn't been addressed. Okay. And I, I would like five minutes to do that, or ten. Please. The, the, the problem is with us is that nobody's mentioned fibromyalgia, and it's a very, very ugly word that everybody wants to hate. Because it's it, your immediate when somebody makes the diagnosis that that means they're dis dismissing, it. and it's not real, and that's absolutely wrong. It's a real disease 
It has real needs. It has a, it, it, now the, the neurobiologists call it central sensitization syndrome because the people who have it react to pain differently than people who don't have it. And it's, it's triggered by some other thing. We know that 25% of rheumatoid arthritis patients have it. 50% of sugar patients have it. People after whiplash injuries and after uh, concussions get it. Um, it, has a, it usually has a trigger. And after 40 years, 39 years in neurosurgical practice, I will tell you that Chiari 1, in its form of, that's when it's symptomatic with chronic pain, is a trigger for fibromyalgia chronic fatigue. And the chronic fatigue may be the most disabling part of it. So, and, and the reason that, one of the reasons to be so excited about the idea of using DTI and, and all of that stuff is that probably rec rec uh, relates to the effect of that happening to the, to the, to the forebrain when it's really a problem that starts in the, in the, in the rear of the brain, in the, in the, in the cerebellum, and it makes, makes more sense. And the things that work in, in, in conservative management are things that have been shown to work for, for the fibromyalgia chronic fatigue. In children, it's called widespread musculoskeletal pain syndrome. And, uh, and the, now the new name, there, there are a bunch of new names which uh, have to do with uh, exercise intolerance and uh, a bunch of other things. But we have to keep in mind that there's the, 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 if there's a genetic predisposition to these things, part of that may be the same genetics that they haven't been defined in, um, in fibromyalgia. And, and so we need to be aware. There was not a single comment about fibromyalgia in this conference, and I think that you can't do cognitive testing without looking for and finding whether these patients fall into that, that category. Because those, then you're going to ignore a whole huge population that could be helped if that were the case. And that's real scary. Um, so I, I think that uh, I, I, if, if for the next year, I would ask you to at least take some, some time and talk about fibromyalgia because all of those patients have chronic fatigue, brain fog, um, short-term memory defects, and and so and they get emotional, terrible depression, psychiatric disease, and it's it, it is I, I just hate the skeptics who will not believe that that, that it's a non non entity, and and if we refuse to, I, I'm not saying that we're refusing to, but. We need to spend more time thinking about the correlation of fibromyalgia with, with, with TRE, and that, that I'm, I'm, that's my sermon. I, I think that uh, Phil Allen's work, uh, which is trying to tease apart chronic pain issues uh, from, from other drug aspects of, of TRE's, can, can fit into that sort of issue I, about chronic pain. you got to call it what it is. <laughs> what is that of the, the Muslim um, <laughs> Islam terrorism? There was one question that I can. For me, thank you. Yes. Um, yes. Um, I was going to ask about autonomic neuropathy and how it's related to these disorders because we see that diagnosed in some patients with dysautonomia, Chiari, malformation, connective tissue disorders, and it's pretty common in autoimmune conditions um, in that cluster of patients. And Fibromyalgia is always in that mix. Where is it, and is it related to the actual anatomical conditions that are going on, or is it another entity? Has anyone looked at that, or I've tried to pull that apart? Fraser deserves all the credit for that. I, no, I, I just, in, in the hypermobility connective tissue disorders, all of the nerves are more vulnerable to trauma, uh, whether they're coming out of the spine, as in the nerves, or or peripheral uh, nerves, and they're finding all forms of small fiber neuropathy, and, and, and the, it's been suggested that um, connective tissue, which, which not only covers and protects all of the nerves, but it's present right down to the, even the um, subcellular organelles of neurons, that it may be having an effect. Uh, so um, I, I think, um, what I've seen is that dysautonomia, I presume that's what you meant by autonomic neuropathy, it's, it's not just brainstem, it's not just cervical or thoracic spine, it's also the fact that the cardiovascular system is 
completely um, out of control because of the distensibility of the venous system and uh, and, the, and the overreaction to sudden drops of pressure. And so it's a multifaceted problem uh, that goes well beyond neurosurgery and neurology, but involves uh, every organ system in the body. And um, but it's certainly something we need to address, but it's uh, way more complicated than I can understand. Thank you. Thank you all. First of all, I really want to thank my research colleagues um, um, for rounding that up. Uh, thank you for, for running the show here for the last session. And um, Fraser, and Mark, and Hal, thank you. Certainly, foremost, I want to thank Dr. Jeremy Schmarman for co directing the conference. And um, uh, I think we posed the question fiction or reality. I was going to say it's reality, right? I hope you agree. And I uh, also want to thank the great audience and those great questions, and certainly all the faculty. Um, so um, I hope we can continue and go in the spirits that we, um, uh, you know, think about the brain in uh, various ways, and um, we'll go for completion at Chiari. And I know that Dorothy is already all forward, and uh, so okay, Dorothy, we need you. Uh, thanks again, everyone. Um, safe trips back home, and um, appreciate you spending the day with us here.